everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly wrap up. This is going to be a longer than usual wrap up probably because I'm actually covering two weeks of reading and I have 11 things to talk about. Let's just get straight into it. The first half of these were books that I read for the underhyped readathon from September 3rd to September 9th. For the readathon, my definition of underhyped was fewer than 500 ratings on Goodreads. Since I was reading a surprising number of new releases, a lot of things ended up counting for that. So the first thing is a children's book. This is Nurk, The Strange Surprising Adventures of a Somewhat Brave Shrew by Ursula Vernon. This is one of her first published children's books before she was writing Dragon Breath before she won a Hugo for Digger. I happen to really like her artwork and I really like her sense of humor. So it is what it says on the title, a, a not very brave shrew gets a letter asking for his help. Somebody mistakes him for his very adventurous grandmother, I think. So he heads on down a river and ends up helping dragonflies and fighting against a naked mole rat or whatever. It was interesting. It was funny, um, but I definitely think that it isn't as good as Vernon's later work for children. This was just, you know, like her first book for kids and you can kind of tell, but it was still very sweet and very enjoyable to read at the time. Then I read Poetry. Uh, now We Are Sick, an anthology of nasty verse edited by Neil Gaiman. This is not something I picked for myself exactly. I randomly won this um, anthology of poems from a world builder charity drive thing they did during the holiday season last year. It just showed up in the mail and it was short and I thought, well, I guess I'll read it and then see if I want to keep it. It's exactly what it says on, on the tin. It is a short collection of gross, humorous poems about Th things like poisoning people and murdering them and nasty creepy crawlies under the bed and I was surprised that Diana Wynne Jones had a piece in it. Yeah, it wasn't really my thing but it was a little funny in places but when I finished it my stomach was churning. This will really suit some people. I can think of some people who have some darker more gross humor than I do who would probably really like it and yeah. <laughs> Then I read Behind the Throne by KB Wagers. This is a newer release this year. It's space opera slash sci-fi court intrigue and the back really heavily compares it to Star Wars, compares the main character with Rey and Leia from Star Wars. And I don't think this is space opera really, and I don't think it's anything like Star Wars. My highest praise for this is that it was a really fun book to read. Um, it's about Hale, a gunrunner who is dragged back to the Indranan Empire by two bodyguards who find her because she's the heir to the throne. Her older sisters and her niece have been assassinated. Her mother, the Empress, is not really of sound mind anymore, and she's the only person to inherit the throne. The Indranan Empire is also faltering. They're on the verge of war with another neighboring kingdom. It all feels like it's crashing down, and somebody wants to assassinate Hale as well. So she comes back to the Indranan Empire. She had left 20 years ago. She didn't want to have anything to do with this anymore. And now she has to find out who killed her family and she's got to be Empress and solve all the problems. So this is, I think, quite a bit of setup. It's all about her coming back to the Empire and figuring out the politics and the court intrigue, who to trust, who she can't trust, um, working out who her generals are, who her council is, and then this relationship between her and her bodyguards. Not a romantic one, by the way. Her bodyguards are male, and I do believe that they they are a couple, because it's implied that when these bodyguards come in pairs, they are couples. I just, I think the world building in this, the characters are really interesting. There's a lot of diversity here. The Indranan Empire is definitely Indian culture, like Asian Indian culture. 
it felt so different from other sci-fi that I have read. It was definitely not pulling from the standard cliches of culture and, and world building and such, so that was really cool. Uh, there's also quite a bit of diversity in gender and in sexuality. The way that the Indranan Empire started with the colonization of the planet, um, it's basically a matriarchy now. So we kind of have this um, I'm going to say oppression of the sexes flipped here, but women are in power and they kind of see and treat men in the way that in the real world women are often viewed and the tensions because of that are really interesting in this story. I think the only real problem with this is the writing wasn't as finessed and experienced as I would want to. It is a debut novel, so I will forgive it gladly for that. Um, I will definitely read the next book when it comes out at the end of this year, and I hope that it will be an even stronger installment. Next is Everfair by Nisi Shaw. I got this book from NetGalley uh, in exchange for a review. I've decided to not do a full video review on this book because I have written an entire review which I will link down below. It was a very anticipated release. I did enjoy reading it, but it wasn't as strong as it could have been. I don't think it achieved its full potential and therefore it was a little bit underwhelming, a little bit disappointing. Um, this is about the the founding of a country called Everfair in the Congo in the late 1800s, and then it covers 25 years of their history. Um, Everfair becomes a kind of haven for the native people of the area, also people brought there as slaves, like some Chinese people, um, who were trying to escape the really horrible rule of King Leopold II of Belgium. This is all based on real stuff that actually happened there. Um, and it asks the question, how could history have been different for the people of the Congo if they had access to steam power technology early, if it had given them an advantage over white colonialists? It covers gender and sexuality, race, religion, colonialism, and all of these things. And that was fantastic to read because of that. But it was stretched too thin and went too quickly over this vast timeline, three different wars, and at least a dozen viewpoint characters, I think. So, mm, just a little disappointing. Also, the cover art for this book is done by Victo Nye, and I love her artwork. She's done artwork for Tor.com's short stories online, and that's how I discovered her. And I was like, this cover is so cool. Who did that? Victo Nye. <laughs> Next, I read Mostly Void, Partially Stars, and The Great Glowing Coils of the Universe by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. These have illustrations by Jessica Hayworth in them, and they are volumes one and two of the Welcome to Night Vale podcast episode scripts. It's totally awesome. If you don't know what Welcome to Night Vale is, it's an extremely popular podcast in the format of community radio broadcasts from the desert community of Night Vale, where all the conspiracy theories are true, weird things happen on a daily basis, people die horrifically in the streets, and everyone thinks it's completely normal. <laughs> It is surreal and bizarre, and I absolutely love it. Uh, it's now in its fifth year, and I've been listening to it for three years. You can kind of tell I'm a fan of it from the posters I have on my wall and everything, and oh yeah, I have the tarot cards. Last year, Welcome to Night Vale released Welcome to Night Vale, the novel, which was uh, kind of a standalone story that also fit into the podcast episodes, and I thought that was pretty good. Uh, but my one true love is the podcast itself, and these books are not original stories. They are just the scripts of the first, the first 49 episodes plus two live shows. Um, and it's great. I, I just I think that they're really cool to listen to. I've listened to most of the episodes from the first two years, two or three times at this point, uh, but they're really great to read as well. So I absolutely loved these. 
I gave them both five stars. It's just really fantastic. And every episode has a little piece of commentary or introduction from either the creators or one of the voice actors. If you've never tried Welcome to Night Vale before, you could absolutely pick up like the first collection and read it and see if you liked it. But I truly think that Night Vale is best experienced to its fullest extent in the podcast episodes because it is meant as an, an audio experience. So that just I'm just gonna squee over these for a little while. <laughs> we Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. I am so glad I finally read this. It was the first pick for my friend Rachel's little book club and it was so good. Just excellent writing, chilling story. I don't really like reading horror. I don't like reading scary stories. And for the past couple of years, I've heard people tell me that this isn't that scary. It's not like outright horror. It's something that I could read and really like, but not be super scared by. And I think that's because maybe Shirley Jackson always writes like this, but this book in particular, the, the terrifying things are from human nature. It's about Mary Catherine, an 18-year-old girl who lives with her older sister Constance and their uncle Julian in their Blackwood family mansion. They are shunned by the villagers. Something horrible happened six years ago. Somebody put arsenic in the sugar and most of their family died and either Constance or Mary Catherine did it. And then one day their cousin Charles arrived and it upends their world. Throughout the entire thing I was wondering about what had really happened and what was really going on with Mary Catherine and Constance. And at the end I didn't have all the answers but it was just such a good book to discuss with other people. Next, Hieroglyph Stories and Visions for a Better Future edited by Ed Finn and Katherine Kramer. This is an anthology, a very large anthology over 500 pages long of optimistic science fiction stories that imagine a better future through science and technology. It was inspired by a piece that Neil Stevenson wrote back in 2011 I think. And I learned about this because I read one of the stories called Covenant by Elizabeth Baer and I was like, this is such a good story. I need to read the entire collection and the idea of it focusing on more positive science fiction, more positive futures really appeals to me because I feel just inundated with dystopia and apocalyptic type stories these days. You, the way the world is going right now, you want to read something nice about the future once in a while. The problem is, this was so boring. Every story, with the exception of Elizabeth Bear's, felt tedious and just a little repetitive and not really as optimistic or innovative as I thought they were supposed to be. I did like Neil Stevenson's story, which is the first one about a guy building a tower into space. It, it appealed to me in some way. And then there were a couple of other stories that were also kind of male entrepreneur decides to build a gigantic thing with no apparent purpose or use and fights against all odds to get it done. I'm like, that is not, that's not interesting at all. There were also some stories that focus more on, on social aspects, which I think is really important and interesting to read most of the time. A lot of the stories were by women, surprisingly enough, um, but still didn't capture my interest. I was just so bored during most of this, I made myself finish it. It might be that I listened to it on audiobook, it was a very long audiobook and I could have read it faster than I listened to it. And I wasn't thrilled about the narrators. There was a man and a woman doing the narration and I thought both of their readings were uninspiring and uninflected and just, it was so boring. I don't know. I, I like the idea of this anthology, but it doesn't achieve it very well. Uh, it, it wasn't as interesting as it could have been. So sad to say this was a disappointment. Let's talk about an anthology that I really liked. <laughs> this is Women of Futures Past, edited by Christine Catherine Rush. It contains 10 classic science fiction stories, all happen to be by women. This is not a collection of feminist sci-fi. And I say that because Rush's introduction, she has a very lengthy essay at the beginning of this, is very clear that feminist sci-fi is a thing unto itself and 
Women don't just write feminist science fiction. Feminism is a topic unto itself, and there are many other types of science fiction stories, and women write all of them. So the point of this collection is supposed to show the variety of stories that women have written, that they have written so well, many of which have been very influential in the field, and say, this is what these fantastic women have been writing for decades, and why the heck are they forgotten? The, the introductory essay by itself is just worth reading, like buy the book for that if you want to, because Rush's opinion on this issue of women being forgotten in science fiction and the story that she tells was kind of different from perspectives I've been hearing, she basically comes out and says, I didn't really think that this was an issue, even though I'm a woman, until it happened to me. I just really liked how she talked about that, and her introductions to each of the stories uh, were also very good. This is just a really great anthology, just the selection of the stories in general was very interesting, and I really hope that more volumes. Like, this, could this please be a series? Because I want to read more of these. And as she points out repeatedly, for many of these authors, the older ones in particular, almost all of their work is out of print. So if I want to read more by C.L. Moore or Lee Brackett, how the heck am I going to get my hands on these stories? And they weren't anthologized in the best ofs. <sighs> Frustration abounds, guys. If it sounds at all interesting to you, if you want to read classic science fiction stories, whether or not they're by women, doesn't really matter. This is a really great collection. It's some very strong selections here. And if you're about to say, where are the women of color? That is something that Rush brings up herself in the introduction. And right now, I'm just really pissed off at Octavia Butler's estate because really. The next one uh, that I listened to on audiobook is The Hunt for Vulcan and How Albert Einstein Destroyed a Planet, Discovered Relativity, and Deciphered the Universe by Thomas Levinson. There's no way I was going to remember that subtitle without reading off my phone. This is a short book, a short audiobook about celestial mechanics, orbital mechanics, Newton's laws, discovering the outer planets, and then people wondering what the heck is causing the wobble in Mercury's orbit around the Sun? Uh, for a long time in the 1800s, they theorized that there was an, another planet in the inner solar system called Vulcan, or possibly a collection of asteroids that was affecting Mercury, and they couldn't find it. And then Einstein came along with general relativity and solve their problem for them. <laughs> the first two-thirds of it are really history, and I liked that. Some of it was repetitious to me, the whole part about Newton. Uh, with, I had already heard that story so many times, but where it, Einstein is introduced and his involvement with the question of Mercury and Vulcan and how that relates to general relativity, I didn't know about that. So this was fascinating. Like, the last third of it alone was really interesting, but I enjoyed the history part of it as well. If you're interested in physics and stuff like that, this is a great little book that dives pretty deep on just one small thing, one historical event, and tells you about it. And the last thing I have to talk about is Angels and Exiles by Ive Maynard. This is a collection of his short stories. I had incorrectly stated before that these were all stories that he wrote in English and they're not. At least half of them were originally published in French or were also published in French. So if you're looking for translated science fiction, here's a collection for you. This was a really surprising collection for me. Um, unlike a lot of things I pick up, I knew nothing about it. I had never heard of the author before. It's one of the free books that I got at Worldcon, and it is on the more bizarre, slightly horror end of science fiction. I think that's what Chising publications is known for. They're a publisher from Canada. Um, but I ended up really enjoying a bunch of these stories, and I really like Maynard's writing style. It's just sharp and enthralling, and the world building that he creates and then so efficiently, effectively describes. He's never info dumping on you. I thought every single one of these stories was just in, a, in their execution, excellent. 
even though there were a couple that had subject matter I didn't really enjoy reading, they were just they were just really strong. I have written a review of this where I go over all the individual stories and my ratings and short thoughts on them, so I'll link that down below. I'm not gonna repeat myself here. Um, I'll just tell you briefly the stories that I really enjoyed. Tobacco Words was my absolute favorite in the collection, followed by Rose of the Desert and then probably Stolen Fires. Um, I also liked In Jerusalem and Within the Mechanism. Yes, if you see this, pick it up and read it because I think it deserves more attention. All right, those are the 11 things that I read in the past two weeks. A pretty darn good batch of stuff with just a few duds, so I'm happy with that. If you have read any of these or if you want to read any of them, please comment down below and give me your thoughts, and I will talk to you again in my next video relatively soon because I already have it filmed. So until then, bye.